Asians age really well. I'm 73 years old. You guys had no idea. <laughs> It's like Asians age so like Asians age so much better than white people, right? Like Asians age like wine. White people age like bread. <laughs> okay, not all the white people like that. <laughs> Come on, white people. Why I gotta be so crusty? Uh, so yeah, I'm an Asian comedian or a comedian who's Asian, depending on who you ask. Uh, there's not a lot of us, all right? Not a lot of people. Not a lot of Asians, I think, have the courage to get on stage and destroy their parents' dreams. <laughs> but my parents are from Hong Kong, I grew up in Canada, so my entire childhood was a mixture of white and Asian stuff. So like peanut butter and jelly fish. <laughs> Which is delicious, by the way. Anybody here eating it? Yeah, yeah Asians, yes. Because you know, like, here's the thing. If, Asians eat everything, right? You guys know that. Shark, jellyfish, duck, whatever. We eat everything. <laughs> Like in China, the show Planet Earth airs on the Food Network. <laughs> but kids made fun of me because I ate everything, because my immigrant mom made the immigrant mistake of sending me to school with an immigrant lunch. Right, you guys all know what I'm talking about, right? Now, my mom sent me to school with ox tongue, which is oh, delicious. Yeah, I know. But the kids made fun of me. I went home crying to my mom, I was like, mom, no more tongue, which is a weird thing to say to your mom. <laughs> But uh, no, I, ri I rode horses when I was a kid. That's very white. Uh, look, I know Asians ride horses too, but I was a competitive show jumper. Yeah, I know. It's a very non-Chinese way to ride a horse. <laughs> no, because all of you know, as all of you know, the Chinese way to ride a horse is to slaughter Mongolians. <laughs> but I rode horses very white uh, but my parents would take the riding crop that I hit the horses with, they would beat me with it. Yeah, very Asian, <laughs> right? Because different cultures have different ways of disciplining their kids. Like Asians hit their kids, white people use Santa. <laughs> By the way, my parents never let me believe in Santa, didn't want me growing up thinking a white man will ever give anything away for free. <laughs> this is the thing, Asian parents are not about positive reinforcement, all right? Like my parents never hugged me when I was a kid. And if it makes you sad, that's because you're weak. That's what China's going to take over the world. <laughs> I've done that joke a lot. Only white people are ever sad. Asians are like, yeah, of course. <laughs> I think it's because white parents, they take positive reinforcement too far. You know, I was recently hanging out with a friend of mine and her five-year-old was just punching her for no reason. She was like, oh my God, if you stop, I'll give you chocolate. What? That's insane. That would I mean, that's insane. That would never work. If I was a kid and I punched my mom, I'm not getting chocolate. <laughs> I'm getting sold on the black market. Because <laughs> look, I'm not an expert at raising kids, but if I had a dog and it bit me, I'm not going to give it a treat. <laughs> I'm going to give it chocolate. <laughs> so we don't have kids. <laughs> Uh, we don't have kids. We did try. We tried to have kids for a little while, and that was pretty not fun. Because uh, when you try to have kids, all you can have is procreation sex, which is the worst. Right? The whole time I'm having it, I'm thinking, man, this next orgasm could cost me a quarter million dollars. <laughs> it's like really hard to come. When it's <laughs> My parents were happy that we were trying to have kids because they want grandkids bad. I was like, why do you guys want grandkids that bad? Do you think if I don't have kids, the Chan name will die out? <laughs> Just no more chance. <laughs> I think we're gonna be okay. <laughs> but I think it would be fun to have kids because when you have kids, you can play pranks on them. That's what my dad taught me, all right? This is the, this, he played pranks on me all the time. This is the worst one I ever did. When I was applying to university, you only applied to three universities. If you don't get in, you don't get in, better luck next year, all right? And then the day the, the results were coming out, I went home, I asked my dad, I was like, dad, did I get in anywhere? And he was like, no. Everybody rejected you. <laughs> And I started crying uncontrollably. And he let me for like 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, he's like, nah, this is a funny joke. You got in everywhere. Because <laughs> my dad is awesome. 
I was so mad, all right? But I got my revenge, right? This is what I did, this is good. I moved to Kingston, made him pay for a degree in chemical engineering. I moved to Montreal, made him pay for a degree in environmental microbiology. Then I moved back to Toronto and I became a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, so I have a Chinese name. It's Tan Siho. It means warrior poet. Very cool. My white name is Leonard. <laughs> Thank you. Your laughter confirms what I've always suspected. <laughs> it's a very dumb name. It's not a cool name, all right? It's not a name that women can scream out in bed. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. Like, oh yes, Leonard. <laughs> right there, Leonard. Like, stop saying my name. It sounds like you're banging a dentist. <laughs> There's no more cool Leonard's, man. They're all dead or gone, all right? Leonard Nimoy, Leonard Cohen, Kawhi Leonard. I know, that was too soon, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm telling you, when the Ra how do you guys feel about the Toronto Raptors? I'm telling you, man, when the Raptors won the NBA championship, that's the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. Like, I was happier when they won than when I got married. No, no, to be fair, I've loved the Raptors for way longer than I've loved my wife. <laughs> Like at this point, I would divorce my wife. I would have married Kawhi Leonard and that would have convinced him to stay. I would have taken his name. I'd be Leonard Leonard. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> oh man. Uh, my wife is a cool name. Uh, a little backstory. Uh, I married a white woman uh, because screw those white guys and their Asian girl fetishes. I'm taking one back for the team. <laughs> Yeah, we need this. My team's getting killed right now. <laughs> but my wife's name is Jackie. And if you guys were paying attention... <laughs> yeah. yeah, my last name is Chan. Yeah, yeah, she took my name. I'm married to Jackie Chan. <laughs> the irony of my life, man. Trying to take one back for the team, convince a white woman to love me, marry her, turn her into the most famous Asian in the world. Oh, man. <laughs> I got married for that joke. Uh, <laughs> I like it though, man. I like being married. It's nice not having to do stuff alone anymore. You know, like dying. <laughs> My wife and I, we play video games together. We play this game called Bomberman. For those of you who don't know, it's a game where I try to kill each other with bombs before time runs out. And I beat her all the time and she gets so mad. She's like, why do you keep killing me with bombs? Like, That's literally the point of the game. <laughs> and she's like, why can't we just cooperate and keep each other alive until time kills us? I'm like, that's what we're doing in real life! We're just waiting for time to kill us because we said the words till death do us part, all right? That's an open-ended commitment. I can live a long time because my parents love me. They had me vaccinated. That's right, no hugs, but no smallpox either. It's a good trade. <laughs> But my wife and I, we talked about it, we both agreed, right? Marriage has been ruined by modern medicine, right? <laughs> Let me explain. Uh, when they first invented marriage, people didn't live that long. You got married at 16, then at 23, you died of the mumps. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> That's seven years. That's a reasonable amount of time to be with one person, seven years. You get the seven year itch, it's a rash that kills you. <laughs> Because now I gotta live a long time. And this is what I've learned about marriage. Marriage is about putting up with stuff, all right? Like my wife is late all the time and it drives me insane because I was always taught to be on time. The other day I called my mom, it's like, mom, we should get together, have a family dinner. It's been a while. She was like, yeah, we've been having family dinners for the last six months. We just haven't invited you because you're late all the time. It's embarrassing. I was like, what the, who's at these family dinners? I'm an only child. <laughs> My wife wants to do The Amazing Race together. You guys know The Amazing Race? Yeah. Right? You know, time management, critical to success on this show. <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's do it. It'd be a super fun way to get divorced. <laughs> you know, because that's what would happen. Like, her being a little time is very stressful to me. Like, it's so stressful, I'm having nightmares about it. Like, a couple weeks ago, I had a nightmare that my wife and I were two unicorns late for the ark. <laughs> And I'm trying to get her out the door. I'm like, it's a boat party. You can't be late for a boat party. And she's just brushing her mane, painting her hooves, whatever it is unicorns do to get ready. 
And of course, we leave the house late. We get to the dock just in time to watch the ark sail away. It starts to rain. I wake up furious. <laughs> and my wife is just sleeping next to me, all innocent. Like she's not responsible for the death of an entire species. <laughs> it's just like, you monster. <laughs> briefly consider smothering her with a pillow, which <laughs> I don't, obviously I don't because I love her. Also, it's not gonna help me. Even if she's dead, she's still gonna be my late wife. It's <laughs> a long way to go for a pun. Thank you for coming with me. <laughs> But marriage is about putting up with stuff. Like my wife loves cats, that's her thing. She rescues cats right into my house. There were 13 cats in my house right now. Yeah, it's fucked up. You know what's like living with 13 cats? It's like a wish gone horribly wrong. Like I met a genie and I was like, I want to live in a house full of pussy and this is what I got. Not that I would know what to do with a house full of pussy, right? I do not know anything about sex because I grew up before the internet, right? Like back, you know, there's porn everywhere now. There's porn in the air. I could pull up my phone, open a browser, hit a bookmark, bam, porn. <laughs> and here's the thing, like when I was a teenager, at the height of my porn needs, all I had, porn-wise, was a VHS tape I borrowed from my dad. Right. <laughs> and the problem with VHS is that the tape begins where my dad finished. <laughs> that is too much goddamn information. <laughs> I don't need to know that. Also, when I was done, I had to rewind the tape to where it was, replace it, leave no trace, like a horny little ninja. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, because of the internet, like, kids today know so much more about sex than I did today. <laughs> now, my problem is that I went through sex ed in the 80s. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, right? So you know. They didn't teach us anything, right? Like, the only thing I learned from sex ed in the 80s is that I am woefully inadequate compared to a banana. <laughs> yeah. They did not teach us anything useful. Like how to make a woman happy, that would have been good. Okay, this is how they taught us about the female anatomy, all right, with a house metaphor. The front door is the labia, the front hall is the vagina, open the door, enter the hall, that's it. Yeah, they did not teach us about the importance of the doorbell. <laughs> Located conveniently above the door. <laughs> They didn't teach us if you want a happy home, you just push the doorbell once, maybe twice, maybe multiple times while you're rushing in and out of the house. <laughs> the doorbell's a metaphor, guys. No, you get that, you get that. <laughs> the only reason I say that is because the last time I told this joke, there's a guy in the front row, he looked very confused. <laughs> and I was like, sir, what's the problem? He's like, I like to go in through the garage. <laughs> I was like, sir, it doesn't matter what door you use, you still have to let them know you're coming. <laughs> oh, man. They say when you get married, you stop having sex. Uh, I am here to tell you that that is not untrue. <laughs> but the weird thing is I thought it would be her. It's not her, it's me. I just have different priorities now. I don't care about sex anymore. Like if 20 years ago, somebody said to me, look, here's the deal. You can live in this house with this beautiful woman. You can have sex with her anytime you want. All you have to do is turn off the TV. <laughs> I would have been like, yes, that is an amazing deal. I'm in, sign me up. But like, nobody told me how good TV was gonna get. <laughs> TV is amazing right now. Like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Rick and Morty, TV is way better than any kind of sex I'm capable of. <laughs> And also, I am so lazy, all right? Given the choice between sitting on the couch with a bag of Doritos or hovering over my wife and planking for 13 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, 13 minutes. 
<laughs> um, I told this joke a couple nights ago. My wife was, was in the front row. I said 13 minutes and she snorted. <laughs> Damn it, I forgot you were there. <laughs> but no, love is hard, man. We all have these expectations of what love is supposed to be and they're all screwed up. Right? And I blame Hollywood rom coms, I blame top 40 love songs, I blame boys to men, basically. Do you guys know that song, I'll Make Love to You? All right, listen to the lyrics, right? <clears throat> I'll make love to you when you want me to. No. No. I will make love to you when I'm done this episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> and I'll hold you tight, baby, all through the night. No. No. When I'm done, I am moving to my side of the bed. Yeah, where I can regulate my own goddamn temperature. and spend all this extra money in a king-size mattress so we can huddle together like hobos with hypothermia. <laughs> love is hard, man. Love is work. It takes work to keep things interesting, you know, like sexually speaking. Uh, like my wife and I, we've tried all the sexual positions. Both of them. <laughs> all right, there's only two. There's only two. There's me on top, there's her on top. That's it. Yeah, we call the second one white on rice. <laughs> My, uh, my wife likes the dirty talk, uh, which, I mean, I'll do it. I don't get it. There's certain things I would never say, you know, like, who's your daddy? It's like, why would I say that? She's white, I know it's not me. <laughs> the other night, my wife said, hey, can you speak dirty to me in Chinese? <laughs> I was like, what? She's like, Chinese is a sexy language. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> Chinese is the language of my parents yelling at me. <laughs> but I wanted to make her happy, so I'm like, I'm gonna do it. And, I, and what I realized is that, wait a second, she doesn't speak Chinese. <laughs> I can say anything I want, as long as I say it in a sexy tone, it's gonna work. <laughs> so I, I always, I always, I was like, oh, the gahaka, how come die? Sneak preview from the Asians, that's funny. <laughs> For the people who don't speak Chinese, what I said was, oh, your shrimp dumpling is so big. <laughs> and then I said, oh, a song said like a chow fun. Which means I want to eat your rice noodle. <laughs> and then, oh, like a tong hola. How soon? Which means your soup is so hot <laughs> and sour. <laughs> and then we didn't have sex because I got real hungry. <laughs> I, uh, I took my wife to a sex store recently to buy her a toy because uh, I'm tired. I'm so tired. <laughs> And we picked, she picked out a toy. It was like a foot long, had 15 settings. I was like, Jesus. I have never made you happy, have I? Like, what, what is that? Is that a lawnmower engine? What the fuck? Like all I'm saying is women have amazing selection when it comes to toys, right? Men, not so much. We went to the guy's side of the store, found this one toy. It was a lump with a hole in it. That's it. That was the whole toy, a lump with a hole in it. That's not a toy. That's a toy the way a pet rock is a toy, right? You drilled a hole in your pet rock, you tried to fuck it. <laughs> My wife was like, why would any guy want to have sex with one of these? I was like, it's not plan A. <laughs> but my favorite part about the toy is you turn it over, it says dishwasher safe. <laughs> Which is amazing. I don't want to hand wash my own shame. <laughs> I could never buy one. I'd be afraid. What if I die and my mom finds it? You know? <laughs> I would not be dead enough. <laughs> I think that's the difference between the men's toys and women's toys, is the shame, right? Because if a woman dies, they find a vibrator in her apartment, nobody gives a shit. But if I die, <laughs> whilst in possession of a flesh rock, <laughs> the only thing people are going to be saying at my funeral is, can you believe what they found in Leonard's dishwasher? 
<laughs> oh, man. Uh, so the fun thing about marrying a white woman is that now I have white parents, which takes some getting used to, because uh, I've had Asian parents my whole life. And yeah, it's my white parents, my Asian parents are very different. Like I show up to my white parents' place and they hug me and I'm like, whoa, parents do this? What the? <laughs> this is crazy. See, the thing is my parents, they, uh, they, st oh, they started hugging me, but only since I started introducing white women into their lives. <laughs> like I brought a white woman home, she hugged my mom and dad immediately upon meeting them. They're staring at me like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> Because this thing, like, Asians, the only reason Asians touch each other is make more Asians. That's the only reason, all right? Or make fewer Asians. That's procreation or murder. Those are the choices. So they hug me, but now, so the thing is, though, my, my parents are not good huggers because they spent seven decades not hugging and they're bad at it, all right? Like, my mom comes at me sideways with, like, a half backpack, like, it's some creepy guy she's trying to keep in the friend zone. I'm like, Mom, I was inside you for nine months. We're more than just friends. <laughs> uh, my white parents, very supportive of my comedy. Uh, when I told my Asian parents I was gonna become a comedian, they immediately went through the five stages of grief. <laughs> it's very sad for them, but they've made it through, and now they're actually quite supportive, uh, just not publicly. Uh, <laughs> my Asian parents have never seen me do comedy. I think they're afraid if they see it with their own eyes, the nightmare becomes real. <laughs> They definitely don't tell their friends I do comedy. And I know this because my buddy Dennis, his parents and my parents have had dinner once a month for like 50 years. And he mentioned to his parents that I did comedy, like they're having a family dinner. And they were like, what? He doesn't have a job? <laughs> How does he make money? <laughs> and Dennis is like, no, no, no. He goes, like, he tells jokes to white people at Legion Halls in small town Ontario. <laughs> and they're like, and he makes a living doing that? No, he does not. <laughs> he does not. Here's the funny thing, so I went back to tell my parents, I was like, why don't you guys tell your friends that I do comedy? And they looked at me like I was stupid. <laughs> and like, his, my friend Dennis, he got divorced and his parents didn't tell my parents about it. So his divorce is the same level of shame as my dreams. <laughs> it's brutal. Oh man. Uh, this my, my favorite part about marrying a white woman is for the next 30 years, I'm gonna keep looking like this. <laughs> She's gonna keep getting older. <laughs> like, ah, at some point, real soon, everybody's gonna start thinking I'm her adopted Asian son. Because <laughs> that's what the stereotypes about Asians. Asians. Asians age really well. I'm 73 years old. You guys had no idea. <laughs> it's like Asians age so. Like, Asians age so much better than white people, right? Like Asians age like wine. White people age like bread. <laughs> okay, not all the white people like that. <laughs> Come on, white people. Why gotta be so crusty? <laughs> now, there's a lot of stereotypes about Asians. They don't all make sense, you know? We're the best at martial arts, worst at driving. That's ridiculous, right? They can't both be true. You think a guy can catch a fly with chopsticks doesn't know how to make a merge? <laughs> And I hate that stereotype that Asians can't drive because now every time I get behind the wheel of a car, I feel responsible for my entire race. <laughs> like I'm an ambassador now. I can't be out there playing bumper cars, messing up for everybody else. <laughs> and a few months ago, I got into a car accident. <laughs> it's not my fault, but I know it doesn't look good. Because <laughs> now I'm standing on the side of the road in front of this smashed up car looking all Asian. <laughs> People are walking by, they look at the car, they look at me, they look at the car, they look at me, they're like, of course. <laughs> I'm like, no, it wasn't my fault. That guy T-boned me, my passenger side door is all banged up, I didn't slide sideways in the front of the guy's car. And they're like, yeah, whatever you say, Tokyo Drift. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm getting so mad, because I can feel every single Asian stereotype being reinforced. So I'm yelling at all the cars that go by. I'm like, no, I'm a good driver. I'm terrible at math. I have a huge penis. <laughs> Didn't help that the guy that hit me, also Asian. <laughs> so I talk about Asian stuff a lot, but I'm always surrounded by white people. So every now and then, and this is weird, I forget that I'm Asian. Like the other day I was hanging out with my wife who was white and her friends who are white having brunch, which is white. <laughs> and then somebody says something like, yeah, white people like us. And I'm like, yeah, white people like us. <laughs> Nobody noticed that I'm not white. Like, I didn't even notice that I'm not white. I was like, what the hell happened? 
Like the other day, I went and did hot yoga, then I went to Starbucks, got a berry hibiscus refresher. I'm not just white. I'm a white woman. My Asian friends make fun of me for being too white. I was like, I don't know what that means. I was like, how white am I? So I went, on, I went online, took a quiz. How white am I? <laughs> Turns out, pretty white. I was checking off a lot of boxes. Like, I do listen to NPR podcasts. <laughs> I have used the phrase, uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. <laughs> I did go to a Taylor Swift concert when Brian Adams rose up the stage to duet on Summer 69. I cried. <laughs> it's a very specific quiz. <laughs> Turns out, according to the quiz, I am 76% white, which is very white. But taking that quiz made me realize that I have not forgotten my Chinese roots. Because I was furious that I only got 76%. 76% is an Asian F. <laughs> oh man, so I, uh, I took one of those DNA tests to make sure <laughs> I'm Asian. <laughs> and I got my results, and it turns out yeah, I'm Asian. <laughs> I'm Asian, like pretty much 100%. And uh, that, that information cost me $130. <laughs> My dad was like, I could have told you that for 65. <laughs> See, things, these DNA tests are not for people like me, all right? My DNA is just rice farmers the whole way back. <laughs> like, I think these DNA tests are for bored white people who want something interesting to say at cocktail parties, you know? Like, they get the results and they're like, Come on, Cherokee. <laughs> Come on, Cherokee? Fuck, Hitler! <laughs> oh man, you guys are a fun crowd. I love, I love that I get to do comedy, I get to do fun shows like this. Uh, every now and then I have to do shows that are not as fun. Like I recently had to perform comedy at a birthday party, which I did not enjoy. Because uh, first of all, I didn't get into this business and not be the center of attention. But, but also, it was just a weird party, all right? The theme of the party was the Great Gatsby. That's not the weird part. Uh, no, everybody there was Asian. Yeah, that's the weird part. <laughs> you guys remember 1920s America when Asians were doing great? <laughs> yeah, me neither, all right? Like the only historically accurate person there was the DJ, because she was laying down tracks. <laughs> you didn't laugh at that, you need to read a book. <laughs> it's an Asian heritage minute. <laughs> but Asians are doing well, all right? China's doing very well, which makes my parents happy, which is good, because I can't do it. I became a comedian, that ship has sailed. <laughs> And everybody says China is going to go to war against America, which I think is true. I mean, it's already happening. Uh, soon to be former President Trump he started this whole trade war against China, which is not going well. Because uh, America can't win. It's impossible. Like, first of all, nobody wins trade wars, all right? How they work is governments put tariffs and everything, prices go up, people buy less, people lose their jobs, everybody suffers. And that's where China shines. <laughs> The Chinese people know how to suffer. <laughs> my parents lived through the Cultural Revolution, all right? My mom's like, oh, Americans know how to suffer? You just take away their toilet paper. <laughs> my dad's like, oh, they do a trade war against China? The dollar store becomes the hundred dollar store. <laughs> Trump is crazy. He's like, trade wars are good and so easy to win. He wrote the art of the deal. I'm like, motherfucker, we wrote the art of war. <laughs> And look, this is just a trade war against China. In a real war, America has no chance. One, it's just a numbers game. China has so many people. China could drop people on America instead of bombs and still win. <laughs> Which brings me to point number two, China does not give a fuck about human lives. That's how you win wars. And I know they don't give a fuck because I was recently on a flight back from Hong Kong, Chinese airline, the in-flight snack was peanuts. <laughs> yeah. China does, they don't give a fuck about your life-threatening allergies. <laughs> That's how their government implements quality control on their population. <laughs> Chinese government's like, oh, your kid dead from peanut? Yeah, your kid no good. <laughs> you try again, you try harder. You make a new kid, you make a better kid. <laughs> 
If China wants to win a war against America, it doesn't have to fire a single shot, just has to put a peanut in every iPhone. <laughs> Which brings me to point number three, why America can't win, all right? Chinese military leadership is no joke. We have General Tao. <laughs> we have General Tao chicken, that's right. Yeah, the man is a general, all right? The highest ranking American chicken officer. Yeah, he's not even a real colonel. <laughs> So I, mean, I wrote that trade war joke a year and a half ago, and I was like, this has got two, three months on it at best. <laughs> nope, still going. <laughs> Trump has not figured out tariffs are, and he's not ever gonna figure it out. So I'm putting it on this album, because if he somehow avoids impeachment, gets reelected, oh, I know. <sighs> but if it happens, you can listen to this joke and laugh about it on an iPhone that costs you $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, he might get reelected if he avoids impeachment. Uh, because he's got supporters, man, they're ride or die. They will fight for him even if it doesn't make sense, all right? Like I did a spot on national television, I made fun of Trump a little. I didn't say anything bad at all. I started getting hate mail. And I was like, whoa, I made it. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I was so happy and I was reading these mail. Here's the thing, like, for somebody to send me that, they had to see my comedy, made them feel something, and they had to look me up online, figure out how to contact me, draft a letter, proofread it, because some of these were shockingly free of typos, <laughs> and then send it, and uh, I responded to every one of them, because I'm a comedian and my days are wide open. <laughs> and I'd be like, thank you so much for taking the time to let me know how you feel, because that is time you have wasted. <laughs> but it is time that you could have spent committing hate crimes. So. <laughs> oh man, Asians are doing all right. We're getting a Marvel superhero. Yeah, yeah that's fucking awesome. I uh, forget the name of it, uh, China Man, is that it? No. <laughs> that's not right. Who would that guy's superpowers be? You know, he fires cheap labor from his wrists. <laughs> he owns Captain America. <laughs> Oh, he's being played by Simu Liu from Kim's Convenience. You guys know that? You watch that show? Yeah. Now, that dude is sexy, man. He's gonna make Asians sexy. You know, because you guys know the stereotype that Asians are sexy. <laughs> yeah, most of you do not. Because <laughs> it doesn't exist. Asians have not traditionally been regarded as sexy. And it, uh, I hope that changes. Here's, uh, you guys remember that movie, Romeo Must Die with Jet Li? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so in that movie, he saves Aaliyah like, from a horde of bad guys. In the end, they're supposed to kiss. But test audiences were like, kissing an Asian? Gross. So they turned into a hug. I was like, he fought off hundreds of bad guys with his bare hands and all he gets is a hug? Look, I'm not saying she owed him anything, but he at least deserved a hand job. <laughs> like to me, Romeo Must Die is a movie about the harshest friend zoning of all time. <laughs> But now we're getting a sexy Marvel superhero and it's great. And I'm very happy that they keep putting Asians in all these Hollywood movies, but I don't think Asians will truly be represented until we're on the front page of Pornhub. <laughs> right, that's where it's at, right? The front page of Pornhub. Like right now, the front page of Pornhub is just like an uneducated sommelier, right? Just wants to pair everything with white. <laughs> it's like white guy, white girl, white guy, Asian girl, white guy, black girl, not too black. Uh, <laughs> No, I didn't make the rules. Like, you don't, you'll never see a black couple on the front page of Pornhub. I mean, you'll never see the Obamas on the front page of Pornhub. And never an Asian male. I mean, I looked. I did a lot of research. <laughs> and I feel like that has to change. Um, I mean, I'm not going to do it. This is not a be the change you want to see in the world kind of situation. <laughs> My parents are already pissed I'm a comedian. I don't think diving dick first into porn is going to make it any better. <laughs> And it would, I, would, I would have to be a porn star, right? Because Asian parents are very demanding. <laughs> Couldn't be like a porn character actor or whatever, that won't cut it. And I can't do it because like, they've never seen me do comedy, but I know that if I just do porn for half a second, they will immediately see it. And I cannot handle that criticism. <laughs> I can already hear my mom. This is what you happens when you don't practice. <laughs> 
just like the piano. <laughs> Fingering is all wrong. <laughs> oh man. Uh, Saturday Night Live, right? They hired the first ever full Asian cast member. Yeah. And all the Asians were like, yay! And then the same breath, NBC announced that they hired a white guy who called us all chinks on podcasts. And we we're like, oh, why can't we have nice things? <laughs> I mean, they fired that dude, all right, which is great. And now there's like a comedy civil war happening. Uh, just for the record, I'm on the side of the chinks. <laughs> and but the other side, they're saying stuff like, oh, you can't say anything anymore. And you just keep digging up stuff from people's past and ruining their lives. And look, I get it, to be fair, to find that podcast, they had to dig deep all the way back to last year. <laughs> 2019, man, you want to keep your job, you have to hide your racism better than that. This isn't some low-key position like running a country. <laughs> this is Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and that guy, in his, his defense of himself was that he was pushing boundaries. He's pushing boundaries, all right? And like, I get it, I'm a comedian. I want to push boundaries too. He's got to take risks. He's pushing boundaries is how you make progress. But if you use homophobic or racist slurs, you know, you're pushing backwards. And that's not progression, that's oppression. And that sets us all back. So fuck that cracker. <laughs> fuck that cracker. Fuck that cracker, not you crackers. You crackers are awesome. I mean, you are top notch crackers. You guys are premium plus crackers. <laughs> Here's the thing, I can call a white, people, a white person a cracker and they can't get mad if a white person calls me a chink, they lose their jobs, right? That's, those are the rules, is white people are still on top for now. <laughs> that might change. And I'm gonna, we might flip the script and I'm gonna tell you if Asians are on top, I'm gonna be nice. All right, if a racist calls me a chink, I won't get mad. I will raise his rent. <laughs> <laughs> the racists are mad right now, they're marching. And I was like, why are you guys marching? What do you want? Like, do you not have enough steps on your Fitbit? Like. <laughs> You own stock in a tiki torch company? I don't understand why you're marching. And I think they're marching because they're losing. And I get it, I don't want to lose either, all right? And I think for them, it has to be a matter of perspective, right? They have to look at it not like they're losing racial supremacy, they have to look at it as though they're gaining permission to call me a chink. It is a fun word, all right? Chink, 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 chink. It's like a slot machine of racial slurs. <laughs> It's a very fun word to just scream in a crowd of strangers. I've been doing this a lot. It's very therapeutic. <laughs> Although if you're not a marginally successful local comedian, I cannot recommend it for you. <laughs> Here's the thing, like, it's not even that bad of a word, you know? Like, as evidenced by the fact I've been screaming it for the last two minutes. It's not like the N word, which is a word so bad, you can only say the first letter. Like, chink isn't even the C word anymore. <laughs> like, it's stolen from us by the cunts. <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is you can say anything you want, just don't be a dick about it, right? Like, look, you guys came out, you didn't expect for me to call you a cracker, but we're still having fun, right? And that's the thing, you can say whatever you want, don't be a dick. All these guys are like, you can't say anything anymore, what about freedom of speech? I was like, you have freedom of speech. You call me a chink, you don't get arrested, that's freedom of speech. What they want is freedom from consequences. And I'm sorry, but if you call me a chink with hate in your heart, you don't get to keep your job at Tim Hortons. <laughs> You pack that hatred up and you take it down the road to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> oh man, no, Asians are still on, uh, we're not on top, we're catching up. Asians are catching up to white people. We are. And I know this because of how they treat our mass murderers. Okay, it's a fucked up premise, but stay with me, all right? Look, every time there's a mass murder, if it's a black guy or a brown guy, they blame the culture. They're like, it's all that violent rap, it's all that violent religion. But if it's a white guy or an Asian, magically, it's a mental health issue. <laughs> right? They don't blame the culture. They're not, oh, it's all those violent John Woo movies and all that Michael Bublé they're listening to. <laughs> they blame the individual like they're supposed to. So they treat Asian murders like white murders. We made it. Yeah, high five. <laughs> Give it up, white guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, you might ask yourselves, how many Asians actually commit mass murder? 
Well, more than we should. <laughs> Uh, the population of North America is 9% Asian, but Asians make up 17% of all mass murderers. I know. Yeah, even when it comes to mass murder, Asians are overachievers. <laughs> and look, you guys laughed at that because you know the stereotype, but it's a positive stereotype. This is also a lot of negative stereotypes about Asians, like Asians have small dicks, which maybe you'll stop saying now that you know how much we love murder. <laughs> So my dad, the other day, he called me a banana. Yeah. Uh, you guys know what that is? No. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's, uh, it's a term for an Asian who's been westernized. So yellow on the outside, white on the inside. And I was like, Dad, where did you learn that word? <laughs> kind of insulting. Although not as insulting as when my Chinese dad said I was probably Korean. <laughs> yeah. That's probably more insulting to my mom than anything. <laughs> But this is the thing, like white and Asian, that's been a theme my entire life, you know, these different cultures, and there's good stuff on both sides. You know, like Asian culture has given me a strong work ethic and the idea of family. Western culture has given me mac and cheese and the Gilmore Girls. <laughs> and it's great. And like, like I'm genetically Asian. We've established this. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. And I know that because I get mad when people use racial stereotypes and I cry during Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, and I'm culturally white. Uh, and I know this because I get mad when people misspell my name at Starbucks and I cried at a Taylor Swift concert. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm proud of being culturally white because white pride is no bueno. <laughs> but here's the thing, like I don't really, if somebody asked me what I am, I wouldn't say like white or Asian. Like I just don't, I would rather name a house of Hogwarts, you know? Like I identify as Ravenclaw. <laughs> I feel very strongly about this, guys. <laughs> You know, I, I get a little annoyed when people say I'm too white, but God help you if you call me a Hufflepuff. <laughs> I'm gonna get hate mail about that now. <laughs> I don't think we're defined by our race. Like if somebody looked at Barack Obama and only saw a black man, I don't think they're a good person, all right? I think we're defined by what we love, all right? My wife loves cats. She is a cat lady. My parents, love to brag about their son's career, so they are disappointed. <laughs> and I love my wife, I love my parents, and I love comedy, so I'm a husband, a son, and a comedian, who just happens to be 100% Asian, which is an Asian A-. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>